My name is Elizabeth Warren, and I'm the chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel. It's been six months since the original law was passed to fund the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, with $700 billion. For this monthly report, we go back to a question that our panel has been asking since we issued our first report last December. What is Treasury strategy? We thought a good starting point for an examination of Treasury's approach to dealing with the banking portion of the crisis was to look back at how bank failures have been treated in other places and at other times. Basically, there are three choices available to policymakers. Liquidation, close down the bad banks. Receivership or conservatorship, reshape those banks in place. And subsidization, provide them with money to get them through the rough times. A good example of the first option, liquidation, comes from the savings and loan crisis in the 1980s. The government shut down unhealthy financial institutions by transferring depositors to another bank, selling off assets, writing down some debt, firing the managers, and wiping out the investors. Depositors did fine, but investors and managers took a real hit. Not surprisingly, liquidation can be politically difficult, and management of weak banks really don't like it. It is possible that liquidation could destabilize markets if it came as a surprise or was not well explained. But liquidation has the benefits of avoiding the uncertainty and open-ended commitment that accompany ongoing subsidies. Because it gives a clear and decisive message about the health of the banks and the willingness of the government to shut down the bad ones, it may speed up recovery. The second policy option is a government reorganization or conservatorship. Two examples are Continental Illinois in the U.S. in the 1980s and the financial crisis in Sweden in the 1990s. The failed managers are replaced, bad assets are taken off the books, and parts of the business may be spun off. Depositors and some bondholders are protected, and the bank may emerge with the same name but a much healthier balance sheet. This option makes it clear what the newly cleaned up bank is really worth, so it can usually attract new investors. But the reorganization can be tough for governments to manage, and there's a risk that a bank run by the government could be hit with political pressure. To avoid these problems, there's a real value in returning the banks to private hands quickly. The third option is government subsidies for troubled institutions, which was the approach used in Japan during that country's lost decade. Subsidies may be direct by providing banks with money, or capital infusions in banker lingo. Subsidies may also be indirect by purchasing bad loans off the books at inflated prices. Giving subsidies can obscure the real value of the assets. Knowing the government will add taxpayer money to any purchase can make it really hard for markets to function normally. Subsidies also carry a risk that they will be open-ended, propping up insolvent banks and delaying economic recovery. But subsidies may help banks get through tough economic times until growth begins again. If a crisis is short, that may be all that's needed. As we studied these historical precedents, we observed that each successful resolution of a financial crisis involved four critical elements. Transparency, meaning swift action to ensure the integrity of bank accounting. Have we insisted on the truth and made it clear what the bank and its assets are really worth? Assertiveness, meaning aggressive action to address failing banks. Have we taken decisive action to improve the balance sheets of the banks that can be rescued and shut down those banks that cannot be saved? Accountability, meaning holding management accountable. This means replacing and, in the cases of criminal conduct, prosecuting failed managers. Fourth, clarity, meaning a clearly explained government response. Have we been frank in disclosing all forms of assistance that the banks are getting and clearly explain the reasons for spending taxpayer dollars? In the past, successful revival of a national banking system has always included these elements. Sure, there are differences between a current crisis and these past efforts, 
But these four criteria give us a way to evaluate Treasury's actions over the last six months. When Treasury's efforts are measured against these four tests, there are reasons for hope and reasons for concern. The blanket subsidies provided to banks last fall under the Capital Infusion Plan fail to provide transparency, accountability, or clarity. The current Treasury Department has announced that it is implementing procedures for greater transparency about the financial institutions and the processes for using TARP funds. In addition, the newly announced Public-Private Investment Program PPIP in Washington, could remove bad assets from the bank's balance sheet. The complexity of the program makes it harder to be clear, and a small number of private investors may receive a lot of money from the program, while taxpayers bear most of the risks. Bottom line, Treasury's efforts to date could be enough, but we will continue to press Treasury about these four tests. So where do we stand? In the past six months, the Treasury Department has spent about $590 billion out of the $700 billion allocated for the program. Treasury has also used about $1.3 trillion from the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. In the report, we go over many technical ways to measure whether Treasury's efforts have helped the economy. At this point, we conclude that the evidence of success or failure is mixed and we promise to keep reporting on this. Now back to the big, big picture. The FDIC and the Federal Reserve are also working with Treasury on a number of programs, but so far Treasury has focused on providing banks with direct and indirect financial assistance. Treasury's overall approach seems based on the premise that the banking problem is temporary, and look, we all hope that's the case. If it is, more aggressive steps may never be needed. It is possible, however, that Treasury's approach fails to acknowledge the depth of the current crisis. The economy may not come roaring back, and the big profits that propped up the banks during the housing boom may not return. For some, that means it is necessary to consider alternate approaches. There's some disagreement even on our panel about whether we should be discussing alternate strategies at all in a time of crisis. By taking some time to look at the big picture, however, this panel hopes to help Congress, the Treasury, and the American people to understand what has happened so far and to weigh the available choices as the nation grapples with the worst financial crisis it has faced since the Great Depression. <laughs>